tucked into a spooky back alley, into a secluded room of an illicit speakeasy, filled with gambling, liqueur, and podcasts. Come inside, sit down for a drink, and join us while we discuss film noir of yesterday and neo-noirs of today with your hosts, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. But what about us? Memories. You're talking about memories. Good, now have a drink. I don't want anything of his or any part of him. Except his life. I wonder if I know what you mean. I wonder if you want to. Play it for her, play it for me. And I lived a few weeks while she loved me. Waiting for a lady. Someday you'll understand that. Got some news that's gonna take a lot of attention off you and Laura. Stop it, yes, I can't take any more of it! I should be in the phone. You know the story? My story. Maybe because he was drunk. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. Well, I'll give her the message. I never sleep all over America. Welcome to the Speakeasy Noir Cast, a podcast discussing film noirs of yesterday and neo noirs of today. Each week, we will deliver a discussion and analysis of classic and neo noir films, all mixed in with our unintelligible banter. Your hosts for the show, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. You have an optimistic attitude of my failures of course i did i'm here to motivate and this is our charm this is why people listen to us because they want to see who fucked up this week and how bad (laughs) right (laughs) let's just embrace it (laughs) it's fine yes i feel like edward g robinson in the movie that we're going to discuss today do you yes Doing all the wrong things for all the right reasons. (laughs) (laughs) And failing anyway. (laughs) 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 Oh, well, it's good to be back again, Carly. So much fun to go through these, uh, these films, revisiting some, uh, some ones I've seen before, like, like tonight's film. I don't know if you had ever seen it. I've never seen this one before. Yeah. You know, I'd bought the, there was this, uh, in, in, I'd say like the early two thousands, maybe there were these big, huge box sets that this company called Mill Creek would put out where it'd be like a hundred horror films or a hundred murder mystery films or whatever it was. Wow. And they were all mostly public domain, uh, movies that they were just repackaging and it was shitty packaging. It would just be this huge, weird, bulky case with a bunch of discs inside and individual sleeves or something um and and 90 of the movies were were pretty pretty bad or such a horrible quality that they really weren't watchable um but then there were some gems in it and one of the box sets that i picked up was a noir a film noir box set um and there were two volumes of it and this film was in one of the volumes and I'm finding out now, obviously, because it was a public domain movie, which I think is crazy. It is crazy. We need to – there's no even way to, like, buy it, is there now, because it's gone into public debate. You don't. Now, there are companies that, that find these, and they go and they research, and they find the original film elements, and they'll restore them, and then they'll re-release it. And that version is not in public domain. But if you find, like, a, or the original 35 millimeter like, print or digitized version of it or whatnot, you know, that will be in, in public domain. But it's insane to me that a movie, like, we're going to discuss tonight it, it is in the public. Like, they didn't care about renewing the copyright or whatever it is. It's just some, some of these films are amazing films that just shouldn't be. I'm glad they are, but they just shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. But... So we can get into it and we can, you know, tell people what the film is. Let's go ahead and uh, maybe get into our drink for tonight. This one doesn't exactly relate to the movie or anything, but because of, you know, some of the the past of our lead character in this film, I chose a drink called Blood and Sand. 
Oh, nice. It probably should be like Blood and Ice House. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does have ice in it, so we'll just go with that, okay? Okay. It works. <laughs> it works. All right. So Blood and Sand, folks, is one ounce of orange juice. Uh, it is one ounce of sweet vermouth, one ounce cherry flavored liqueur. So I know Carly's cringing. Yeah. And one ounce of blended scotch whiskey and a cocktail cherry. And it sounds pretty damn good to me. I can't wait to, to drink this one. Um, you add ice over water to a cocktail glass, add ice to a cocktail shaker, then add orange juice, sweet vermouth, cherry flavored liqueur, and blended scotch whiskey. Close the shaker, shake until the ice sounds different, and the drink is cold. Empty the ice from the cocktail glass, then strain the cocktail over the glass, garnish with the cherry, and serve. I think this sounds like a great little refreshing drink. I, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, if I can substitute cherry for something else, then I'm with it. Sure. Yeah, why not? You know, I, I don't think you'll really taste the cherry in the cherry liqueur, but maybe. Yeah, maybe oh, no, possibly not. Maybe if I take the, the garnish out and keep the alcohol cherry in, then maybe. Now, now this this whole cherry or anti-cherry fetish that you have. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a movement. I, I'm anti-cherry. <laughs> yeah, what, what is the deal? <laughs> Cherries are sweet. They taste great. Like, I don't understand how you don't like cherries. This and blows me away. They taste, they, they just, I don't like the taste of them. And they're strange when they're in a glass with a big stick on them. No. Get out. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you treat it like it's an eyeball staring at you. <laughs> well, kind of. I don't know. Get it away. Take that elsewhere. <laughs> it's absorbing alcohol. Move it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you like an actual garnish that you do like Ooh. or is there one <laughs> I, well do you know i don't know because i had a cocktail once at this really posh uh, this really posh place that we went out to and i, I had a cocktail and it had i said you're gonna laugh at me when i try and describe this it had like it was like a rolled up piece of grass <laughs> but it was really it was like a really thick rolled up piece of grass that was just in it and actually and then afterwards you could take it out and munch on it it was so nice i like that what the fuck <laughs> whatever that was i liked <laughs> <laughs> oh so i think you have like taste buds like shawnee shawnee's not uh yeah i don't know that's that's really strange i've never heard of that oh um grass huh? and i like it when they was put it... strawberries in my gin I like that. That's nice. I never heard of that either. So, well, hold on. I want to get back to the grass. Is this like green grass? Is this like weeds? Like, what is this? Like flowers? <laughs> I want to get down to. Is this like the the wheat grass or whatever it is that they put in smoothies or make those grass drinks out of? Like, what what are we talking here? I have no idea. It, it's literally it was like <laughs> a thick. It was like if grass was a bit thicker and like sturdier, a bit more like a leaf. Like weeds. Yeah, kind of. Are you like, on weeds? It was like rolled up, so it's almost like a little straw, because the barman rolled it up, and then just stuck it in the side. Wow, interesting. And how, what did it taste like? Crunchy. Yeah, but what did it taste like? Did it was it bitter? Was it like sweet? What what, what did it taste like? Come on, we're living vicariously through your grass eating. <laughs> so you gotta know. It just makes me sound like a cow, like I'm just munching in field. Like, oh, <laughs> the grazer. <laughs> I'll, I'll clear your farm field for you. Give me dead. <laughs> <laughs> Must contain alcohol and grass. <laughs> Tip some gin on your grass and I'll sort it out. <laughs> So come on, was it bitter? Was it sweet? I, Tell us about no, this. It kind of had the taste of like celery. Celery. Maybe yeah. it was like shredded celery. It, it had the kind of, mm. you know, that crunchy kind of fresh taste of celery. Yeah. It had that, but it was a lot thinner. Interesting. Huh. I'm going to have to find out what it was. 
Yeah, you should. Since you know the place that you went to, give them a call and ask to you know speak to the bartender. Whatever you guys call them. What out there. did you feed me? <laughs> yeah. What was in this drink? Tell me. You thought it was so amazing, and you love eating weeds. But you want to know what was in it? I want to go look no the field. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> boy, oh boy. All right, folks. Well, we hope you love your blood and sand and you have a drink with us while we are uh, discussing this movie coming up. Um, And now we're going to play you the trailer for tonight's film titled The Red House. Dense forest once covered all of Piney Ridge, but no longer is the region a mystery. Modern highways have penetrated the darkness and brought in the light. Not so in Oxhead Woods, further south. Wait, don't take the Oxhead Woods. The footbridge across the creek is out. Mr. Morgan, take a long way around. But I'll save two miles by cutting through the woods. Yes, but you won't save yourself from the screams in the night that'll lodge in your bones all your life. those woods and I heard things. What things? I don't know. You leave well enough alone, son. You didn't sleep till any 10 or 11 up at the Morgans because you wanted to see her. If you'd spent a little more time working around this place instead of preening your feathers like a pet canary. You might as well still be working at the Morgans for all the fun you are to me. We don't need anybody else. no certain place for me on earth except out there in that ice house does herb love you that much enough to kill for you Okay, so Carly, um, why don't you give us your synopsis in a nutshell? I'd be interested to hear this one because this is such a fascinating film. I'm sure you've come up with something likable and crazy. (laughs) Oh dear, you're in for disappointment. (laughs) Here we go. And now it's time for Carly's super famous in a nutshell synopsis. A brother and a sister try and fail to stop teenagers being teenagers. Done. (laughs) Done. (laughs) We need to put like a little record scratch in there. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think think you leave a lot out on that one. That's the, that's the essence. If they weren't being, this wouldn't have been a problem until they reached puberty and started wanting to go meet in the woods and be strange with each other. This is where it all fell apart. That's true. Be strange with each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's true, though. You're right. Yeah. I think you left half the movie on the table. but <laughs> It's basically, it's all the kid's fault. <laughs> if he'd have just stayed on his farm, just the three of them, it would all have been fine. Yeah, I think, I think Pete would agree with you. Yep. <laughs> I've got his back. <laughs> God damn kids. Yeah. It's like Hannah. The only reason why Eric Banner and everybody else dies in that film is because Hannah gets to be a teenager and decides she's going off and doing whatever the hell she wants. Just like I've never this. Seen it. It's just like this. He should have just stayed in a cabin, mm. listening to Eric Banner, recite tales about fish. It all would have been fine. But no. And someday he turns into the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Oh, poor Eric Bana. So that was the trailer for the 1947 film called The Red House. Uh, it was also known as No Trespassing, which I'm not entirely certain if that if it was ever released under that title or if maybe that was an original like script title or what. Um, I've never seen it uh, a version of this film with that title used, but apparently that was the original name of it. Um, and it's a 1947 psychological thriller 
uh, film directed by and written by Delmer Davies, um, who is also the director of one of Carly's and mine's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's our favorite film, but we definitely enjoyed it. Uh, Dark Passage. Oh, yeah. Definitely top five. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and this film stars the amazing Edward G. Robinson, who we've covered over several films before, um, Lon McAllister, and it was adapted by uh, adapted from the 1945 novel *The Red House* by George Angenou Chamberlain. Um, it also stars Judith Anderson and Rory Calhoun and um, Alan Roberts, or Elaine Elaine Roberts. Yeah, it's Meg Elaine. Roberts. Spelling of her name is a little strange, but I believe it's Elaine Roberts. <laughs> Not that I would know. I, I mispronounce everything. So. I was going to say, we've gone Whatever. a couple of episodes with you saying stuff right. Yes. <laughs> the first thing of this movie is striking is the poster. It just looks scary, which is unusual for a film noir. Um, and, and I think that the fact that they call it a psychological thriller is a bit telling because it's that it is that it also is a noir and it's also scary as hell. Um, and, and that stems a lot from the lighting and Edward G. Robinson's performance in this. Um, he's, he's one scary dude in this movie. Um, and it, it doesn't start out that way. I, I really appreciated that they build like this, this lore around this family. Um, and they're sort of like the family that's talked about. They're the recluses. They, they stay in their farm. They live off the farm. They don't profit by it. And that was something that they pointed out in this film, which was interesting. Um, and as such, they're sort of, a bit removed from the town folk and society in a way, not because they're standoffish or weird or anything like that, but just necessity. Like they, you know, I believe, um, uh, the sister, uh, uh, that plays, um, I believe it's, uh, Judith Anderson plays Ellen, um, uh -huh. you know, says in the, in the film, you know, we just really have no need to go into town. You know, unless we need to, we do, we don't go. We live off the land. It takes time and effort to do what we do here. But there is some weirdness as well, as far as who I assumed was their daughter, uh, Meg. And Meg is their adopted daughter, which is further strange because... Uh, Ellen and Pete are brother and sister. So this brother and sister have decided to adopt the daughter of, um, uh, I, I guess, Pete's ex-girlfriend? I don't know. It took me bloody ages to work out that they were brother and sister. Yeah, and I, you know what? I didn't. I, I, it did me too, like for a little bit, but it, I didn't mind it, actually. I thought it was an interesting sort of twist. Oh, no, I, twist I liked it, it. I just didn't realize for ages it, it was one of those like added things like oh oh that's weird that's interesting and, and that this movie sort of kept that the way they withheld information from you i think served it really well as to where some films that you watch where they keep information from you makes it convoluted and not under easily understandable um these pieces of information were character development that you didn't necessarily have to know in order to enjoy the story but gave it a, a, a more um, in-depth, you know, uh, texture to it. Um, and I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, even the backstory of this movie, you don't need to know it. You don't really need to know what's in the Red House or what happened at the Red House. It could be a complete MacGuffin. And you don't need to know in order for this movie to play out. And I think that would have been a, a pretty interesting, like, version of it to – to watch but nonetheless they do tell us and it is interesting and it's all very scary and crazy and you know whatnot however um it starts out as a normal movie you know kids going to school stopping by you know home whatever walking 
you know, with each other back from school and you know, all these like normal things, I guess, from back in the day and having a farm and living off the farm and things like that. And then, you know, it just sort of suddenly gets into this like, um, oh, there's something weird in the woods kind of story, you know. So Meg brings home a boy, um, not, you know, for any other reason other than hopefully to introduce him to her her father or or uncle or whatever he might be called. She calls him Pete in the movie um, to help him on the farm because he has a hurt leg and he's a little standoffish and he wants to do things on his own. He doesn't necessarily want help, but he recognizes that everybody else is recognizing that life is getting a little more difficult the older he gets. So he decides to take the kid on as a a helping hand. And um, unfortunately for Pete, this kid is a pretty curious young adult, as most are. And uh, it just so happens that in order for him to get home um, two hours earlier, which that's a long-ass walk on its own, <laughs> yep. he has to go through the, uh, the, the woods that are on Pete's property. And for Pete, this is a no-no. Like, you don't go into the woods. They're dangerous. Uh, the trails lead to nowhere. Uh, there's wild animals. He's got every reason in the book to not go into the woods. Of course, this teenage kid, you know, is curious. And all it does is pique his curiosity even further. It's like one of those, like, you know, them five-year-old boys that always stop the murderers or foil the plot, the most intricate of plots. And it's a little boy that just won't shut up. That's him grown up. <laughs> yeah. It's it's the persistence of curiosity and stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I'm at I'm at an eight. I'm like you know I'm 41 years old. If somebody says stay out of the fucking woods, I'm not going into the woods. Yeah, I wasn't going in there anyway, so no worry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like I have nope, no need to do that. I've been warned. Yeah, I'm <laughs> fine. Know? I'm fine. I'll take the path. Two hours, no problem. Yeah. But as a 16-year-old kid, I might be like, and eh, fuck you. <laughs> I'm going in the woods now. Yeah, what's in there, huh? Yeah. What are you trying <laughs> to hide from me in the woods? <laughs> right. That's where you keep the money, isn't it? <laughs> Who do you got tied up back there? What's going on? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I want to figure it out because what else you got to do? Yeah. You know? Kids today don't give a shit. They're like, whatever. I'm on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put what's on the words in Instagram. So it won't be yours. Right. Okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, so, yeah, I, I, it was, it was pretty interesting uh, to, to see this sort of flip switch on, on Pete uh, about going to the woods. And it was very, very dramatic. And I mean, I feel like there's certain things like this scene where the wind is just blowing that I've seen in other films that are probably taken from this movie because it's like they made it so dark and sinister and the lighting. And I mean, he gets really, really forceful uh, in trying to explain to this kid, like, don't go into the woods. You know, this is going to, it'll either kill you or drive you mad. The screams it's dangerous. How do you think I lost my leg? All these things. And this kid's like, Whatever. Whatever. I'm going. I, I'm going to save two hours going home. I'm not scared of no woods. <laughs> Just like, really? Do you not hear the wind right now? The wind is literally telling you, stay home or I'm going to put you in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> it's so windy. I feel like this kid's going to blow away in a tornado. Like this is going to be a Wizard of Oz movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, with a lot of these older movies, they did a great job with set dressing and set building and things like that. You never know what's a studio and what's actually like a forest or woods or whatever. Um, and I was really impressed with the lighting in the woods in this scene because uh, it seems so chaotic with the wind. And um, it, it must be a studio because it's all very controlled, um, fantastic lighting and, and, and wind effects and whatnot. Um, I mean, I'm I'm feeling... Like this kid's getting hurt. He's not going to come out of this. Yeah. And this is like the first death of the movie uh, that we're going to see. But of course that doesn't happen. Uh, he he does come to his senses or I guess into this kid's mind becomes scared 
loses his bravery. But to me, it's like he finally gets smart. <laughs> yeah, his brain cell pings. And he's, oh, I better listen to the crazy old man that's been yelling at me for 20 minutes that I can't go into the woods. Right, right. And, and the funny thing about this is, is that this reminded me, it should be the other way around, but um, re-watching this reminded me, I don't know if you've ever seen Evil Dead, mm-hmm. uh, the Sam Raimi film, but there's this you know, famous scene in it where they try to leave the cabin and they have to cross a bridge and the bridge has been broken and manipulated. It looks like a big giant claw coming back at them kind of thing. And this scene where he gets, you know, trying to go through the forest to get home and comes to the bridge that's broken uh, really reminds me of that because evil dead is like filled with atmosphere and the wind and the craziness and this broken bridge thing. And um, I, there was, I'm wondering if Raimi like, drew inspiration from that you know especially this being a movie about a red house which is like you know basically a cabin in the woods which is evil dead Mm -hmm. um that uh, i wonder if that was a a draw of inspiration from because it really reminded me of it do you know what this is the first Um, time that i've ever think that i've ever seen noir horror This is the only one that I can think of. Yeah, I was racking my brains because I was, I mean, I don't, like, horror doesn't bother me. I don't find it scary. It's very, there's very few films that unsettle me. Unless somebody's poking eyeballs out, I can't deal with that. I've got a weird thing about eyes. Don't come near me with that. I feel like the people that, I feel like the people that say that are the ones that are actually the scared the most. Um, I think you're just trying to be brave. <laughs> No, it's You're eyeballs, just like this little boy in this movie. Eyeballs and like ants, if ants are eating your flesh. I'm not down with like insects and eyeballs. <laughs> Other than that, pull someone's insides out and wiggle them around. I'm, I'm totally fine. I thought this was quite atmospheric and quite, actually, I thought this was quite unsettling when I was watching it. Yeah, I think that the psychological stuff yeah. is, um, it, because it can be so grounded. Like yeah. people, people are complicated and uh, they get weird. Um, and and things affect everyone differently. So I, I do think that the, the groundedness of that um, is a scary thing. The only horror, the only horror elements really was kind of the the screams in the in the wood. Yeah, I think it was more the horror elements really come more from the atmosphere and the setup. Yeah, necessarily than seeing any horror. Um, you know, and and that's really the root word of the. It's horrific. What what happened to these people is horrific. The the idea of the forest is horrific. The idea that this man is dealing with whatever he's dealing with, because we don't know till the end is horrific. You can see it in him that he's struggling with, with whatever has happened. Yeah. Um, I think cause he's terrified. It makes you terrified. Yeah, exactly. Cause I mean, you could see, I mean, Edward G. Robinson is an amazing actor and I, I've never seen him like this. This is, yeah, This we've watched a lot of, spoiler alert, we've watched a lot of Edred uh, G. Robinson films um, and even more. And this is the this is the best performance that I think I've ever, that I've seen him in of the films that I've watched. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. Um, I think my, my next favourite probably is going to be maybe Key Largo. Um, I thought he was great in two, which we're also going to be sc- discussing down the road. Ah, see, I thought um, Double Indemnity. Yeah, I mean, that's, like yeah, also good. Yeah. But this. Yeah, it's hard just, to pick. This was just like head and shoulders just out. And he's not, it's not like he's bad generally. This was just like a new level. Yeah, it, it was very, um, it's something I think was m- new for him, but he did it so well and he's so. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just he, the way he carries this this character. Um, I, I think a lot of people, if they just see like a scene from the movie, they might consider it over the top. But if you watch the film, um, it's just you can just tell that there's this this thing that is just eating him up inside. Yeah. Um, and he just he just does it so well. It's just it's just great. And even um, Ellen uh, Judith Anderson, I, I I believe we watched another movie with her already like i want to say the uh the fbi film that we watched was that oh. was she in that maybe oh let's i can't recall it. but she she uh was very familiar to me and i thought she was really good in this film as well and i was really sad what happened to her oh wait she was in laura what oh she's the aunt yeah is she the aunt i think so 
She was. I got distracted by Rebecca. Sorry. Um, Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I think she is the aunt. But I just thought she was really great in this movie. She was very subdued, and unfortunately, she she gave up her life to uh, to take care of her brother. She had the saddest story of all, didn't she? Because she was in love with the doc. Was it the doctor that she was in love with? Yeah, the doctor. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. The cast is just overall is great. Even the kids. Even um, uh, you know the. The actor, the actress that played Meg, yeah. and and tell one annoyed me. Which one? I liked Meg. I liked Meg. Um, n- oh, here it is. Nate's girlfriend. Tibby was that her name? I was waiting for her to get pushed off a rock and swallowed up by the forest or whatever was in there. <laughs> she looked like a school teacher. How they're all? T- oh, you thought she was too old for the role. She just looked. She just didn't. She was just. I didn't like her. She looked like a school teacher, so straight away it looked a bit odd. Then she's off in the woods with a Superman lookalike. No, you don't like it. <laughs> That's funny. I kind of thought the same thing. Yeah, I was looking at him like, God, he looks like he should be Superman. He really missed a trick here. He should have auditioned for Superman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I think that maybe that's a girl thing because – a woman thing, maybe I should say. Because um, – Shawnee also had issues with her. Good, good girl. Yes, I knew. Yeah, and I didn't. I thought she was very typical. Like, I think that maybe that's just a viewpoint from men because she seemed pretty typical female. <laughs> like, I liked Meg a lot. She, she played it a bit more. Very innocent. Very innocent, and, but nice. Wet her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she was fine. It was, it was our other witch. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously that they they did a great job characterizing them, um, and I didn't mind it. I, it just I, it felt it felt pretty typical to me. Um, but uh, I mean, she wasn't terribly bright. Not really. <laughs> but she did. She was very much like a like a character from Blonde Ice, where she knew what she wanted. And mind you, she's just yeah, she was quite calculated and impulsive. So. Hmm. And she wasn't secretive about it either. Oh, no, <laughs> you know, she's no, like, not at all. She's basically like, I'm going to manipulate you to get what I want. <laughs> so Have fun along the way. <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, she's young. Maybe, you know, who knows what happens later on. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought all the, the characters were great and the actors were, were great. I didn't mind her at all. Um, even even her Superman clone. Uh, yeah, well, wasn't it – was her name Tilly? And then the other guy's name was T- Tilly. So Tilly and Teller, I couldn't get my head around that because the names were so no, similar. T- Tibby, her name was Tibby. Tibby, so Tibby and Teller. Yeah, Teller. It sounds like a magic act. <laughs> yeah. I under- I They're under- comic book characters. Yes, I understand that when you say to me, can we change this name because it starts with an M and the other one starts with yeah, an M. Yeah, exactly. Like, Why? What's it matter if we do that? I get it. I get it. I apologize. I'll never do it again. Good, good. Okay. Yeah, it, for some reason that Maybe bugs me no. because like, I, no. I come from reading comic books and I think comic books have the silliest names. Um, Peter Parker. Like they always try to rhyme the freaking names and – when you have a movie and you got characters, like there's 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 some, you know, cinema sense basically. If you have characters that look too much alike, or have too similar of names, it's very hard for the audience to differentiate them, unless their characters are very strong, and, and different attitudes. But it, when they look similar and have similar names, it's just hard to tell who's who. Um, and, and sometimes, you know the name matters. Sometimes you want it to, to play into that particular type of character and, and, you know, maybe you pick a name for a reason, but uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think it matters quite a bit. So I'm glad you see that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. I... <laughs> the critical response to this movie, I think was, was pretty great. Um, and I think that it still is today. Um, I think people can watch this as an older film and I think that they're still going to enjoy it. Um, but I did have, I did have an issue once I got to the third act. Um, and I think Shawnee had the same sort of issue that it started to feel too long. I did um, write a note that um, after God, that probably would have been the third act as well. Cause it was after I thought it was funny that Nate made a stretcher like he's MacGyver out of nothing. 
from Twigs in the Oh, yeah, that's late in the third act, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. Tilly and Teller was annoying because they were both T's. And then I put, <laughs> it's starting to feel a little bit long. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's that's sad to me because I think the editing was really well done in this film. And I think that the longer cuts earlier in the film work perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But then when you break into the third act, I feel like the pace needed to pick up and you no longer needed those long, those longer shots of, for instance, Superman in the woods with the shotgun. Like there's certain just shots that are just way too long. There's no, no reason for it. it. Didn't I don't think it helped build the suspense at that point because the suspense was already built. Yeah, it was already there. And we needed to, yeah, we needed more of the action in you know infused into it. Um, and that's really my only complaint. I think for the film, I, I think that they handled the characters really well and they gave every character a, an arc. Um, even even Teller's mom. Like when they brought this, they didn't even have to have that character in this movie, but it added depth to it uh, to know. And I love their last name, Storm, <laughs> and they named their their store, you know, Storm. Um, I thought that was awesome, and uh, it, it was just it was just a nice little addition to build this world a little bit bigger and to show us more about these characters' lives. And, and that kind of plays in with uh, what you're talking about with Teller and the stretcher. I thought that was kind of neat. And maybe it's just from being, you know, male. I never did like Boy Scouts or anything like that. But there is this sort of like thing that people talk about these days where those those sort of skills are lost. People yeah. are no longer teaching those skills. Like even even when they're talking about him walking home, he's like, oh, the sky is clear. I can see the stars or whatever it is. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I guess people back then didn't have GPS or, you know, Thomas map guides, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they could fall, they, they knew how they were taught how to follow the stars in order to, to make their way. Even, even a young kid like that, um, because it was a necessary, yeah, he was very hands on, uh, wasn't he? He was very, very yeah. hands on. Like there wasn't anything that he couldn't really turn his hand to. Right. And, and and they did they they did a great job building that sort of aspect, you know, and and maybe that's just that time period, not necessarily just that kid, mm. but it felt like it was more that was this time period, and even the aspects of him worried about being considered yellow or chicken. I mean, they really brought those back in like uh, uh, the Back to the Future movies, and and that's exactly where I my mind went to when I watched this because you know obviously in Back to the Future they go back to 1955. You know, and even further back in the old West and the third one, things like that. It was like that must have been something that people worried about back then. Like, I don't think people worry about that anymore, about being called chicken or anything. I think people are so aware of the dangers of life that, you know, it's almost smarter to, you know, be reserved than to worry about somebody's going to call you chicken. <laughs> it's mm. like, who cares a shit? But back then, it's like bravado was meant something more than that. And, having courage and, and whatnot, especially coming out of the war and things like that, like that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that was great character building um, and really puts you in that time period. Um, so I enjoyed those aspects that he could navigate by the stars. He could build a stretcher. Like if I had to build a fucking stretcher, I'd be like, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> is your leg that bad? I mean, realistically, can you hop? <laughs> <laughs> that, right. would be, that would be maybe me maybe I can put you on my shoulder and carry you I think that if we tied my jumper to your arm we could drag you but then I get tired so we're not getting far so back to hopping what if I found a stick and you just kind of hold on to it and I'll try to drag you <laughs> what if I poke you with the stick and hopefully you move a little bit <laughs> yeah like I do not have that skill I could not navigate by the stars I I would have been like hey, if I come to the bridge that's broken I'm going back anyways whether there's screaming banshees in the trees or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a pretty big leap to me. <laughs> he like jumps <laughs> off the bridge. I'm like that was almost as tall as him. He could have broken his ankle. I'm not sure. I would have probably like maybe let myself down off the side. Yeah. Like I climbed down. He yeah. jumped. Like he was like like. 
yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I feel like such a weird watching him, but but uh, yeah, that's uh, you know, men are losing their manliness, and I get it. <laughs> it's a thing. <clears throat> Self preservation in twenty twenty. <laughs> Um, so I could totally appreciate that kind of stuff. I love, I love those sort of aspects, you know, um, I thought it was a little funny that he runs back and, you know, sleeps in the barn and nobody goes out and says, Hey, I'm glad you came back or whatever. They're just like, ah, you know, we'll see him in the morning. <laughs> <You'd be laughs> like, yeah. But Pete knows, I mean, he's such a great character cause he's like, ah, I'm going to call the kid's parent, you know, and calls him and make sure that, you know, his mom knows where he's at and all that kind of stuff. And, I loved that this kid was all for his mom finding a new husband. And I thought that was really great. Cause most of the time you see these movies like that and they're, they're pissed off. Yeah. They don't want the parents to move on. Yeah. And Shawnee had a great point. She's like, well, yeah, but back then if you didn't have a significant other, you didn't have another husband. Life was so much harder, you know, money wise and living wise that, you know, that was a thing you needed to find somebody. Um, and mom was very dedicated to her son and, you know, put him first and he tried to put her first. And I really loved that sort of dynamic. And, uh, I like how they dealt with that. That was pretty good. And I, I also appreciate that they didn't get too deep into Pete's love story with, uh, Jeannie. Uh, I like that as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was like, you didn't, you didn't actually need to know. I mean, yeah. all you need to know when it comes to love, if you have any sort of life experience, is like this man loved her for whatever reason, it didn't work out. You know, maybe it's because she had a baby with this other man. Maybe she did want to be with Pete. All right. And maybe he gave him the opportunity and, and, you know, maybe Pete isn't quite, I mean, he seems like he's a good guy, but it got to him. Yeah. You know, and maybe he didn't intentionally do what he did. Yeah. But he did. I like um, that though, because then you still have a bit more, I don't want to say sympathy for his character, but because you never really specifically know what happened. Mm-hmm. Like, was he sick? Did, did she sort of like push him? Like, because you don't know, you can still sort of feel a little bit sorry for the way it ends for him. Yeah. And, and I think that's, it's, it speaks to his character that he knows and he's been living with it and torturing himself for all this time. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he's he's literally driven him insane for like, how old's the kid? Like 17, 17 years. Yeah. I don't think him getting caught for a murder and going to prison would have been worse than what he put himself through. No. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, you know, and sometimes, and that's, that's sort of like, in my mind, that's kind of like knowing somebody that's a good person that did something bad than a bad person that's done something bad. Um, because bad people don't care. You know, they, they, they're not going to torture themselves over something that they did bad. And, and it sucks to see, um, you know, it's terrible to see somebody that's a good person who has a good heart for whatever reason it might have been screw up and do something bad even as even as horrific as this might have been and how many people it affected yeah um you know like you said you still have that sympathy for him and it is it's it's a sad story it really is this this entire story is very sad and it's most sad for the sister as well which because he he screwed up made a massive mistake obviously felt guilty and tried to fix it and she just went along with it so she's known all this time. She's had the same secret as well. Yeah, I get the air that she didn't really, she didn't really know exactly what happened, but she did know that he was responsible for it. Yeah, and I think because she knows like the quality of a man that he is, and that he would never do that on purpose. That she's able to wrap her mind around sticking by his side, and knowing that he needs he needs care. And that's really what she is. She's nursing him back to health, uh-huh. um, so to speak. It's just taken 15 years or whatever. Um, but then he go, you know, goes mad again, whatever it might be. And, and I mean, that's, that's a really strong person that does that, gives up her entire life um, and cares about her brother that much to do that. Because uh, I don't think that's a common, a common thing. Um, 
and that's just another one of those character aspects that I loved about this this story. Because uh, she she really did. She gave a lot. Obviously, they they imply that the doctor and her are in love, and nobody knows why they never got together. But it becomes very apparent and very obvious. There's no way that she could have a life outside of this no. without, you know, giving her brother up or letting him go. Yeah. Um, which obviously, that's something very important to him. Uh, you know, he's he's lost so much already in his mind to lose his sister and and Meg would be devastating. And and that's, I think where his mentality was going towards the end of this movie is like, I'm losing everything now. It doesn't matter anymore. And then he snaps, you know, and he keeps seeing Meg as genie and it's just, you know, he's no longer, he's just no longer sane. Unfortunately. Yeah. He's gone. He's um, gone by that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't think he kills himself because he's scared of being caught. I don't think he's, I don't think he kills himself because he's worried about going to jail or any of that kind of stuff. I think it's just out of shame. I think it's like, he just wants to let it be over with and, and be with Jeannie again or, or whatever it might be. I just think it's purely out of shame. Like he, he's done these things that are bad. He doesn't know why. And back then, like psychology is something that's, you know, like mental health just wasn't regarded the same as it, is starting to be now. I don't even think we really regard it where it should be at the moment. No. But it's gotten a lot better. Like people have started to care about people's mental health more. And it's less of a taboo. It's more if you're struggling, ask for help and we understand. As to when back then it was just like suck it up and yeah, get back it. to work. Yeah. You got shit to do. Yeah. Um and it just really makes me appreciate a movie like this that can really show something so grounded, the idea behind this and have good people doing bad things and, and knowing that it, it comes down to mental health. So I wonder if his, if that was his last kind of act of in his mind, like the last little bit that he had left to kind of protect Meg and sort of, do you know what I mean? Because he didn't want to trap her. Like he trapped his sister when she ended up dying in the arms of the person that she didn't even marry. Um, and I, I wonder oh, if you mean letting her go was like him killing himself was sort of letting her go. Yeah. was kind of like freeing Meg from sort of, I don't think so. And I don't think so because I think that he thinks he killed her. Ah, okay. Yeah. I, I think, it, I think he t completely killed himself out of shame. Right. I think, I think he did that accidentally because his mind snapped and he thinks he's living in the past, like reliving that moment. Um, and then realizes what he's done and he can't live with himself anymore. I mean, he's been torturing himself for years and there's no way he can go through that again. It's just like, it's his only out. You know, if he goes to jail, it's not that he's scared to go to jail. He's scared to live with himself. Yeah. Um, but that is a sort of romanticized idea though, of letting her go. And I, I totally get that. And I, but I don't think that that's something that he would be capable of, honestly. Um, if he was capable of that, it would have already happened. You know, I think he was just too, too afraid of, of being alone, I guess. Uh, that was a good point though. I think that would, you know, that's interesting to think about. I did want to bring up Edward G. Robinson again. He's, he's such a great actor. And, um, I did a little bit more research on him while, uh, researching this particular movie. Um, and I completely forgot that he was in Soylent Green. Oh. Um, and I realized that that was his his final performance, um, and that's something that I want. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch. Uh, obviously, because of my love for Millennium, um, I, I've always liked Soylent Green. I thought it was a great movie, but then Lance Henriksen's character Frank Black's uh, passcode on his computer is Soylent Green is people, <laughs> so I, that's like something that always sticks in my head. <laughs> he he, I know that he got into a lot of. He had a lot of heat on him during that communist sort of era of Hollywood um, where they were blacklisting people because they were worried about them making movies that were communistic films or things like that or people were part of the Communist Party. Um, and so he sold out like uh, um, Trumbo. I guess some other people, maybe things like that. And I think that maybe it wasn't really like, I, I know there's some movies about that, but um, reading his history and reading who he was as a person, 
it doesn't seem like he would do that without there being some sort of like blackmailish or like have any tan kind of other thing something else involved yeah because if you read about this man he seems like he was a very well very loved and uh, well respected and loved uh person who cared about the arts and cared about people um and so that seemed like the one thing that i read about him that seemed a little off like this doesn't seem like that would have happened without there being something else involved that we'll never probably know about or maybe maybe it's out there and i just haven't come across it yet but he was a lover of art he had a huge collection of of art and uh, i've seen um i've i can't think of the movie but there was a there was a movie where um they had an actor playing george uh, i mean um robinson uh and, and they had him in his house and he had art like everywhere and I never really understood that until I did this research. I, like, I never knew that he was like a collector of art and all that kind of stuff. Another thing that they did in that particular film, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but is they had his his face was painted like white, like maybe makeup or something like that. And I'm, I'm curious like if that's how he just presented himself or maybe it was just like from coming from, you know, these old black and white movies. I'm not really sure, but I thought that was pretty interesting as well. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of truth to the portrayal of that. But I'd be interested in finding out more about that. Um, God, there's so much. There's so much information about this guy that's just amazing. Like he was supposed to be in Planet of the Apes, but he was having health problems, so he dropped out of that. Uh, amazing people were his pallbearer when he died and passed away, and there was like over like two thousand people at his funeral. Wow. Um, but he had he had uh, your favorite Frank Sinatra was his pallbearer. Uh, wow. Um, George Burns. Um. Jack Warner, the head of Warner Brothers, the producer of The Wizard of Oz. Wow. Uh, Hal Wallace, the uh, producer of Casablanca. All these amazing people were his pallbearers. And like he had so many people at his funeral. It's just, you could just tell like this guy was beloved, you know, to people. Um, and he's just since, you know, uh, been known as a, you know, an amazing character actor. He's on, I think it was maybe the AFI's list of top 25 greatest male stars. Uh He's in the top 25 there. I think it's um, a shame, really, because I've never really, like, you know how I was disgusted with you because you didn't like Humphrey Bogart. I, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that I didn't like him. I just never really. Paid, it wasn't on your I radar? I never paid that much attention to him. Like, I go back now yeah. when I see the films, I'm like, oh, shit, there he is. Oh, there he is again. Bloody hell fire. Yeah. But if you hadn't have pointed me, pointed it specifically out, and I hadn't, right. like, we hadn't been doing this podcast and I haven't gone back and found those films. I would still just be, ah, oh, he was there, but I'm, you know, he would, it would never be something in my mind. And that's just a shame. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's because he kind of had two careers. I think he was a star. Because even, like, um, uh, with uh, everything leading up to, like, Key Largo, he always had, like, top billing. Yeah. But then like Key Largo at that point, Bogart was a big star too. So they sort of did this sort of back and forth. I don't know if like his name was in the middle, but it was slightly higher or something like that or slightly bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I read that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that like he sort of had these two careers going in Hollywood where he was a, an, you know, considered like an A-list actor, but then – um, and I don't know, maybe it was after sort of the communist, uh, I can't remember what they called that. Like they were, they were blacklisting the people that were part of the communist. There was like a name for it. I can't remember. But anyway, I think maybe like after that, he, he started only doing more like, um, supporting roles and being coming a more of a character actor. And that's where you see him pop up in these smaller roles where he's not the main star, but he just wipes the floor with everybody else. Yeah, exactly. Like even like with uh, Key Largo, or even even the red the red uh, house, he's he he shares the screen so much with everybody else that I don't know that I would call him the main star. I mean, Meg is really the main star, yeah. Or, or even Teller. I mean, in a way, like it's really their story in, in a way that intersects with Pete's story. So I, it's really tough because it's. The, this script is so well done and evening that stuff out. They, they, they found a great balance between all those characters. Um, but like he Largo, things like that, he's a supporting, you know, he's a secondary actor, but he's, 
you know, that that's obviously Bogart's story. But I, I think that those, those two, I think nowadays when that happens, it's like, you know, considered like an actor's career sort of wanting off and they can only get these secondary roles because they were a name at some point and people recognize them. Um, but I, I truly believe that Edward G. Robinson got those roles because people wanted him because he was a great character actor and just a great actor in general. Um, and then once you sort of reach a certain age, there's just less of those roles. There's less of those starring roles, you know, which is unfortunate, but just is what it is. Um, let's see, I should have been around in that time because I'd have kept them all in business with my uh, silly little one location scripts about an 80 year old man that's getting chased by a wolf. I mean, yeah. You're welcome. Don't you wish that we could be back then at that time and run yes! a fucking studio? Like I do. I think we would change history. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Okay. What if we were, and what if it went wrong? And what if somebody in a time machine already fixed that? <laughs> and just like dropped us into two random time periods, hoping that, that we would never come together to create more mayhem. <laughs> yeah, you are cut off from having any kind of power. Yep. <laughs> Go to the apocalyptic world of 2020 where you can do no more damage. Right. <laughs> All right, Carly. Uh, rating time. Gen time. Ten. Ten? Ten. Ten. All right. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else to be said about it. I give it a ten as well. I think yeah. it's a great film. I I don't recall ever seeing another noir horror. Nope. And I thought that this was fantastic, everything about it. And it was only that one of the only, uh, I wouldn't call it a horror film, but one of the only kind of horror elemented film that has unsettled me in about seven years. So. Wow. Well, that's something to be said. And without yes, messing with eyeballs. They did it all without messing with eyeballs. So. <laughs> that's what I was just about to say. I, I guess we need more horror films with eyeballs. No, out. Plo, thank you. <laughs> I'm fine for that. <laughs> Speaking of Sam Raimi earlier, have you seen... Um, oh, what the heck was the name of that movie? To Hell... Drag Me to Hell. Drag Me to Hell, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I have. The whole eyeball scene popping out. <laughs> oh, do you know what? It might if if I have, I've turned it off. I don't know. As soon as as soon as eyeballs are on the table, it's like, nah, it's going off. Okay, well, that's a Sam Raimi thing. So you must not have really watched uh, um, Evil Dead either, huh? I watched that through my fingers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice. Well, I give it ten out of ten as well. I think it's just a fantastic movie. Again, my only my only issue with it is the editing is a little bit long in the third act. Um, I think it could use with some just some subtle cutting down just to make it move along a little quicker. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think it's a fantastic movie, and it's amazing to me that they let this go to the public domain. I feel like this is something that should have. Uh, yeah, this should be celebrated. There should be like great additions of this film i almost it's not it's not at the level of say something like night of the hunter but i think it's i think it's good enough to be celebrated in that same sort of uh classic way 100 percent. Um, yeah um and I, I actually think that the story is much deeper than night of the hunter like i love night of the hunter but it's mostly the atmosphere and the the filming quality of it is just so fantastic in the imagery that like you were talking about the iconography of a lot of the stuff in that film is what makes it so well loved. Oh yeah. And with this film, I just think the script is just so good that it really deserves that sort of status as, as you know, movies like that. Um, yeah. So there you have it guys. That is our assessment of the red house. I really hope that you guys check this film out, um, especially if you're into horror or psychological uh, films of that nature. Um, it's This is one to watch. Uh, and one of the earlier types of, I would almost call this Hitchcockian uh, yeah. type of film. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just so, but there's, it's even deeper than a lot of Hitchcock type stuff. It's like, it's very character driven and uh, you really have to think about these characters motives and, 
what they're going through to to really kind of understand understand what's happening and why and it's just it's really fantastic i bet it's one of them that um, you could just you could just continue rewatching it and just always find something new yeah i i think so i think this is this is a type of movie that people should be discussing and debating and um you know delving into i really do i think there's a lot there yeah um and maybe i'm just not intelligent enough to understand that it's not <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just want it to be. I don't know, but I do think that 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 this is that kind of movie. Um, well, I found I found this one because uh, when I went looking on my quest for sort of public domain films to maybe refer back to in another project, remember, we'll tell people we want to we want to do a remake of a public domain film. That's um, fine. People can know that. Well, I also wanted to find some that we could put into, like, for example, Room 19, we talked about a film that we're being Sure, on the sure. TV. Have something on the screen yeah. you know, without having to worry about copyrights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is how I found that. And I was blown away. I was like, this is, this is, this is going in everything we make. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody needs to see it. So we're just going to force it on them. This would be fantastic to use in uh, Old Sins. Yes. I think. I know we wanted to use like, maybe a Bogart one, but. And I guess maybe we need to name somebody Meg or Tibby or Teller or not, no, not Teller or Tibby. They are off the table. <laughs> no, maybe we need to rename Caleb to uh, Pete. <laughs> yeah, I get a mistake. <laughs> yeah, this is going and everything. I don't care what you make. This is on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, guys. We hope you enjoy it. We hope you seek out this film because it's that good. Um, Again, if you love film noir, you love horror, you love Edward G. Robinson, or yeah, even if you, you just don't want to watch a good movie. Yeah, check what? it out anyways. You'll you'll learn to love them, I think. Either that or we're crazy and everything that we're talking about is just over the top. Who knows? But decide <laughs> for yourself. All right. And uh yeah, we will see you guys uh next week uh when we discuss uh, another film and uh so join us then, all right? Till next time. Bye bye. He's looking at you, kid. Thanks for joining us this week on the Speakeasy Noir Cast. Make sure to visit our website, resurrectionfilms.net, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, The Dark Side of Acting Up and The Dark Side of Acting Up Volume 2, now available on Amazon. Or you can check out one of our films, also available on Amazon Prime. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Speakeasy Noir Cast.